Just show your screen in a minute, Jim. Was the most disabled participant screen sharing. So that's what I've got. Okay, you're live now. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Sophie, I've got host disabled participant screen sharing. I think, Tam, if you could work on that in the background while we get started, um, and then yeah. we'll, we'll hopefully we can get it going for when you're up, Jim. Okay. So I'll begin us with a karakia tonight. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā ki na ki na ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi a ki ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhunga, te hei mauri ora. So kia ora all panellists and everyone watching from home on this Sunday night of the long weekend. Um, my name's Sophie and I'm a Kapiti Coast District Councillor and also um, the founder of School Strike for Climate in New Zealand. And today um, we'll be talking all about climate justice, about how to create space for community-led decision making, um, how to involve communities and what you can all do um, as part of this fight for ensuring that this one planet that we all call home um, is beautiful for the next generation and what that looks like too with the impacts of COVID-19 and how we can ensure that through our response um, we are safeguarding this earth. So as mentioned um, this town hall will be, will be broadly about climate change and climate justice and we'll use the example of Kapiti Coast in reference to community resilience and coastal vulnerability in New Zealand. So we've got some amazing panelists tonight and my job is essentially um, to just feedback the questions from the audience and to facilitate um, this town hall tonight. And thank you so much to Tamitha Paul for setting all of this up and allowing us this space. Um, and this awesome, awesome networking kind of resource and um, talanoa, corridor space for us all to, to have this conversation. So I'm gonna, we're gonna get straight into it. We do have um, nine of us tonight to um, be sharing our, our different opinions and thoughts um, and and answers to all of your questions. So first up, we'll begin by passing it over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves and to speak for three to four minutes about what's on top for them in the climate space, um, different things that they're working on, what's happening, what's not happening, what are the opportunities and how can we capitalize on these opportunities? And we'll then move into questions. And most of these questions have come from people tuning in and they're directed mostly to specific people but um, panelists feel free to jump in uh, if you have something that you'd like to add on any one of the questions um, and as there are quite a few of us quite a few of you um, we'll just make sure that we're um, yeah allowing allowing each other the chance to speak and making sure that we're sharing the space so that everyone has a chance to, chance to have their voice heard and we'll aim to wrap up by around 8 45 so I'll be keeping an eye on the time um, it might send a few messages to the chat if we're going a bit longer than intended. So just keep an eye there as well. Um, so thank you so much for all being willing to be a part of this corridor, um, for giving up a couple of your hours as well. Uh, and thanks to all of you watching um, at home. And this will be also recorded and uploaded to YouTube and live streamed. It's being live streamed on Facebook as well. So um, I'm going to pass straight over to Jim Salinger, who will give us um, a brief introduction of himself and um, yeah, what's on top for him in the, in the climate space and the things that he's working on and the people he's surrounded with. So, um, Jim, and then the, the rest of the orders in the chat. Thank you. Can you, you so manage to share your screen, Jim? Uh, it says host disabled participant <laughs> screen sharing. So the answer at this point is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. I wonder if I could, I'm going to try to get the presentation up on my on my phone and maybe I can just hold it up or something. So you just you just go ahead and I'll work on that. Okay, for you, Jim. right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll put it up. There. Uh, so you think you've got it on your phone. Okay, well, um, let me start. Um, I'm just trying to. Um, um, why won't it? Oh, okay, I see what the problem is. Uh, would do this. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry, it's um, suddenly frozen. Uh, uh, you're not frozen for us. We can still see and hear you. <laughs> oh, yes, the pr presentation is frozen. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so let me, sorry about this. It's 
Um, now, I'll try again. Um, well, this is... Why would it suddenly do this? We should have done a dry run, actually. Um, okay, well... Um, so I'll remember it all. So basically, firstly, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jim Salinger, and I first wrote about climate warming in the New Zealand region in 1975. At that point, everybody was believing in um, the next ice age. Uh, so it sort of went against what was the common philosophy then. So, and I've been on this climate journey ever since for 45 years with its twists and turns and that I won't go into that. So getting right into it, if we, this is really a climate stock take as at May 2020. Bearing head carbon dioxide basically shows um, a, a very steady increase since they started measurements in 1978. And if we look at bearing head um, methane, similarly, uh, there's a steady increase. And then what happens is um, there's been quite a rapid increase since about 2010. And this has surprised everyone. So, and you see annual fluctuations. People aren't certain the sources. It could be things like livestock and ruminant agriculture, but it's certainly recent heart carbon. It's not fossil carbon. If we look at global temperatures, uh, 2019 was the third warmest on record. If we look at New Zealand temperatures, and I'm talking about the greater New Zealand region, i.e. the New Zealand economic, exclusive economic zone. Last year was the warmest on record. So uh, our temperatures are going up. And if you match them against global warming, um, we're about where we should be in terms, we've had about half a degree global warming, but since the 1870s, it's warmed in the order of 0.9 degrees centigrade. Now, my next slide was to deal with. Um, did you get it up on your um, phone, Sophie? No, I can't seem to get it up on my phone. It doesn't, it yeah. cuts it out. You can't quite. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're moving on. Uh, so the next point I was putting up was basically what's happened to the glaciers. And I had this brilliant picture of the Franz Joseph painting in the 1890s. And it was right down to a pond called Peaks Pond. And now you see a view of it right up its valley. So there has been a huge change. I think the best way to illustrate it, and James and I and about a cast of 19 have a paper coming out this week, as a result of the two back-to-back -back heat waves, we lost 22% of the Southern Alps glacier ice volume in those two heat wave summers, 22%, that's about so we lost nine cubic kilometer so permanent snow and ice, of course. That's just gone right down the rivers. And we've lost, and I've got another paper uh, submitted, we've lost about half, over half our ice mass, ice volume since 1949. So we're down to about 33 cubic kilometers. We used to be at 65 cubic kilometers kilometers. So my saying is Aotearoa, the land of the light white cloud, is turning to Aotea Poso, the land of the short white cloud. Now my next slide was just showing sea level rise, which was simply what has been monitored by the tide gauges, and that shows it's been increasing whether you look at ports of Auckland or Dunedin or Littleton, all those tide gauges show, oh, 
Now, I haven't got the graph, but from memory, about a 20 centimetre um, sea level rise since 1900. So it's going along as expected. And I had a slide from Rob Bill, which shows what we expect this century and beyond, because sea level rise just doesn't stop at 2100. It actually keeps going. And from memory, uh, I think it's about, depending on the climate scenarios, it's about one um, meter or more or less. And the, f the other slide was to show uh, what was happening with temperatures. And again, this depends on sea level rise, not sea level rise, on which climate scenarios, but it can, if we can cut back very quickly, it's not very much to, if we don't, and it's business as usual, we are up at three or four degrees centigrade. And that was my presentation, but you can share that as part of the resource anyway. Will do. Thank you for that, Jim. So I'll just see if I can. My whole thing's frozen. Um, anyway, so that's it. Kia ora, uh, kia ora matua, Jim. O te rā ki a koutou katoa, uh, koutou uh, ngā kai kōrero mō te pō, ki a koe Sophie te kai whakariti o te wā, te nā koe. Uh, ki a koutou um, e whakarongo mai nei, uh, anei te mihi o te pō. Uh, he uri tēnei o te atiawa ki whakarongo tai, ngā te raukau a te au ki te tonga, rātou ko ngā te tōranga tira. Uh, no o taki a hau e noho ana a hau uh, ki o taki i nei wā. Um, hi everybody, uh, I come from um, what we refer to as the centre of the universe or a little place called Ōtaki um, here on the Kapiti coast um, and really happy to be here tonight with a whole bunch of really interesting speakers. Um, so thinking about what's on top for me, um, I run environmental, um, environmental management consultancy um, providing iwi in the Kapiti Coast with uh, policy and science advice. Um, I also do a little bit of work advising central government, particularly in my area of research, which is uh, freshwater care in Kaitiakitanga, um, and, and also teach at Te Wānanga o Raukaua lecturing in, in Kaitiakitanga there. Um, so through all my work, I... I think a lot about how the poor outcomes that we see environmentally, whether it be climate change or freshwater degradation, um, I see those as, as the consequences of structures of power and cultures of decision making that we have here in Aotearoa. And so through, through my work over the years, I think a lot about um, here in Aotearoa, if we look at the way that decision making happens, um, what are the values and cultural norms that inform that decision making? And many of us that work um, in, in the decolonizing space are quite clear that we, we have a colonial constitution here in Aotearoa. And so the values that underpin um, a colonial society continue to inform the way that decision making happens in Aotearoa and therefore informs the environmental outcomes that um, that we see. And if I if I rattle off, you know, a few of the attributes of a colonial um, constitution that we've inherited essentially from England, I think um, many of the different members here in the discussion could kind of point to how those attributes we we can see that being given expression. And decision making that that has led to the climate crisis that we're in. So, um, some of those things might be, for example, having a hierarchical structure, um, the idea that man is separate from or master of the earth, um, pri the primacy of individual rights, the importance of private property rights above other rights, um, white supremacy decision making processes that privilege certain worldviews, a capitalist economy, um, and some assumptions about um, how efficient or effective a state is. 
um, as the scale to kind of organize your society. Um, so the question then for me and the allies I, I work with is what are the structures of power and decision making that will give rise to good outcomes for the climate? Um, and, and what are the, the types of decision making processes that can assist us um, in a just and effective transition? And, and also particularly for the Kapiti Coast, what I'm now spending time thinking about is assisting us in, in climate adaptation. And so again, if I was to just kind of chuck out as a starter for 10, very much informed by my own kind of indigenous Kaupapa Māori worldview, the types of um, cultural norms and values that might inform that new model of, of decision-making is the sharing of power in decision-making, um, localized empowerment, particularly recognizing the rangatiratanga of indigenous people, cultures of self-regulation, so not having to be directed how to act, but to regulate ourselves, um, the rights of nature, the rights of collectives, um, having primacy over individual rights, um, listening to the indigenous understandings of, of nature, and new economic models. So um, we might have indigenous models, um, models like donut economics that seem to be popular at the moment. So um, that's kind of what's on top for me, how to, how to transition, not just in terms of um, how we consume, um, but how do we exercise power as a society? Um, and I can, I look forward to kind of getting stuck into that corridor if there's the space to do that tonight and particularly looking at the example of COVID and where we might have seen some of those colonial behaviours of power being, ex of power being exercised um, and some opportunities to embed some new values in our, our way of making decisions. So yeah, kia ora koutou. Yeah, kia ora, we'll definitely bring that in when we get to the questions because there's a question that links um, quite nicely to that, Mahinarangi. So thank you for your korero. Kia ora, everybody. I'm Rod Carr. I am a chair of New Zealand's Climate Change Commission. And the commission was born uh, in December last year. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, James Renwick, who is also a commissioner. Uh, the Climate Change Commission has a particular mandate uh, to provide government with advice on climate budgets and emission reduction plans and the national adaptation plan in due course. Uh, but particularly, uh, my background was not as a climate scientist. Uh, I was prior to uh, retiring the uh, vice chancellor at the University of Canterbury for 10 years. Uh, during that time, I was also spent uh, some time on the Reserve Bank board as chair and non-executive uh, director and had uh, prior to the University of Canterbury uh, had time as a deputy governor of the Reserve Bank. So most of my early career was in banking and then some software engineering and then ultimately uh, at the University of Canterbury. Would be uh, fair to say that among uh, the climate community uh, I would still regard myself as a very very new arrival and I have a huge respect and admiration for those who have invested literally their careers and their lifetime in developing the science, the understanding uh, and raising political awareness and getting decisions. And I can absolutely appreciate how frustrated some of that community must be with the slow response that has been evident to date. Um, Top for me at the moment, although the commission is in its early formative period and the staff of the commission are diligently working on the background necessary to engage and develop our carbon emissions budgets and reduction plans, and the commission has taken the opportunity to respond to the particular set of circumstances which you are all aware of and that are unfolding. So top of mind for me in recent weeks has been that whole question of stimulus packages, debt inherited by a future generation, the challenge of overcoming what many of you think of as path dependency, and the opportunity that the current license our leaders have to borrow and spend and invest gives us to make things better as a result of the circumstances we find ourselves in. 
So as a bit of a recap on April the 7th, mindful of the stimulus coming down the road, uh, the Commission wrote to the Honourable James Shaw, the Minister for Climate Change, and outlined six principles uh, that we recommended the decision makers of the stimulus package bear in mind in deciding uh, what should and shouldn't get the thumbs up or thumbs down. Very quickly to recap those six principles, top of the list uh, was to look at all these stimulus and investment decisions through a climate change, climate action lens. And I would go further and say it's not just the stimulus, it's not just public sector investment, but also private sector investment should now always be looked at through a lens of climate action and climate change. And the second of the principles was that we should bring forward and do now things that we know we are going to have to do later as a result of the impacts of climate change, whether that's to appropriately retreat or where appropriate protect against the impacts, whether it's to bring forward emissions reduction programs, we should do now what we have to do later anyway. Thirdly, was to do things in partnership. And that really is important because the way we use fossil fuels is embedded throughout what we produce, how we produce it, what we prefer to consume, and our actions therefore cannot be just led from one or other part of our community. We need partnerships everywhere on all actions. The fourth principle was about making sure that we spend wisely time and money on training and skill development for the jobs and labor force of the mid 21st century, not the jobs and labor force that was required in the 20th century. Our fifth point in our letter to the minister was to say now is not the time to back off some of the hard challenges that we have already brought into the mainstream, whether it's putting an appropriate price on carbon emissions, whether it's beginning to regulate. These are hard things and they're not made easier or better by being deferred. And the final, the sixth of the principles was to rethink entirely how we measure success in our society. That gross domestic product is an overrated measure of busyness in the monetized economy. It is a very small subset of what makes us a stable, prosperous, sustainable community. And we need to be wiser about how we define and measure success. So we put those principles to the minister, shared it with a number of other ministers, it got picked up in the media, which was good to see. Uh, and then we saw coming down the pike another piece of legislation that we proactively responded to. Uh, this time it was the fast track legislation in the name of, of COVID-19 to get uh, RMA waivers uh, we again wrote this time to uh, Minister for the Environment, Honourable David Parker, and basically the letter there was a little shorter and a little more blunt. It, it said that we would recommend this legislation oblige the Minister in considering uh, investments, oblige the Minister to consider the purposes of the Climate Change Response Act, and also that the Minister be given the power to decline to approve any investment which might not support emissions reduction and adaptation. So the commission uh, does have the power to offer advice even if uninvited to do so, and we have taken that opportunity. So the action is now, the effects of course, remain to be seen. Kia ora. Kia Rod, thank you for that. I think that question around how we measure success and how we define success in this space is something that we should come back to as part of this corridor because I think that also links back into the whole um, the whole conversation that Mahina began to touch on around like the structure of deci decision making and is a is a decision successful if the way that it's made um, continues to have a negative impact on, on our environment and those systems um, in which those decisions are being made continue to do that as well. So thank you for that really, really good point that we should definitely re, um, come back to and I've noted that down. Um, Jules, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, kia ora. 
ko Taranaki te monga, ko Waitara te awa, ko Celtic te ke iwi, ko Jules Matthews aho, nā mihi nui, kia koutou. So good evening and thank you so much for inviting me and I am here as both a farmer and um, a member of the Integrity Soils team. So I work with Nicole Masters in Integrity Soils with farmers around the country who wish to transition to regenerative um, practices on their farm. So I think just to begin, I'd really like to touch on what that is from our perspective, because there's a, there's a lot of conversation out there currently about regenerative. And um, just recently, actually, yesterday, I read a letter that was sent from a university in New Zealand to Damien O'Connor comparing regenerative agriculture to COVID-19. Um, so it, it's also a very controversial topic. And I think like a lot of things that are controversial, if we're not clear about what it is we're, and, and distinguishing what it is we're talking about and, and what we're saying, then it can get a little bit muddled. So I think the first thing, if you're looking from a regenerative perspective, um, and I'm speaking you know, specifically about the agricultural sector, the context really is decisive. And we have been farming and we've been, you know, we've, we've done what we've done over the years with the best intentions. And we've done what we've done with guidance from government, from science, from our universities, our educational system. And it's, it's got us to where we are today. So what we can probably fairly safely say is that some of what we've been doing hasn't worked or certainly hasn't worked the way we've intended it to. So it's a matter of just backing out and really having a look from a holistic perspective and um, getting clear about what are those values and what are those principles that are the drivers of how we now view what we're going to do and how we make our decision making. So I think one of the things the regenerative um, arena really offers us is it is holistic and it is applied in local context. So it's not something that's prescriptive and it's really about expanding not just our farmers' understanding and capability, but I think it also comes back to us as people who live in an urban environment is we really need to understand the way our food is going, uh, growing and how that needs to be really um, collaborative with nature. You know, a lot of what we've been doing has been quite competitive. And when you walk, work with farmers to see them transition from being people who are out to um, kill or manage often the things that they're dealing with on their farms and having that shift be one that allows them to really start to collaborate and not just on a um, on an environmental level, but also sort of expand that out so that the health of their finances and the health of their well-being and the well-being of the communities that they're an integrated part of really is expanded. And I think the you know the last few months with COVID nineteen has been interesting to watch because as someone in the farming community, most of us nothing has changed. You know, we've gone to work as usual. We've maybe gone to the store or to town a little bit less. We certainly haven't been going to cafes like the rest of you, but life has continued the same. We still get up and we still go to work. Um, and I think the, the our ability to look at what is it we're actually trying to do as we collaborate with nature. So what we're trying to do, and this is, again, doesn't matter if you're on a farm or in your back garden, you're trying to really maximise photosynthesis and to use photosynthesis to build the health of your soil, to build the nutrient cycling that is fundamental to how all our food is grown. And that in turn is directly related to the health of our environment and the resilience that we are able to build in as we um, improve the function of soils on farms. And, you know, currently soil is our biggest export of something like 192 million tons a year. And no one's getting paid for that. You know, it becomes a 
a net loss, not only to the people who own those farms, but to us as a community. So I think as we, as we sort of engage in this conversation, the, the opportunity for all of us is to expand our understanding and to not look from what is right and what is wrong, but to more look from how can we engage and what is it that we need to be learning so that we can, we can ask our politicians, we can ask our councillors, we can ask our bankers. You know, bankers have a lot to do with what processes and, and, and um, forms of production farmers can or can't do. They're often the people who are ticking off. There are farmers who are not allowed to transition into regenerative practices because it just doesn't tick the right boxes financially. Not because it doesn't, but it hasn't been proven. So we do need, you know, regenerative agriculture is very science-based. And it, the issue we have is it's, it doesn't take things out and put them in a linear reductionist view to examine them. It keeps things in the whole. And it's, so it's a very complex We've got a very, nature's very complex. So how do we simplify that and measure it? Um, and I know recently, you know, Greenpeace has, has really advocating for this money to be sent, spent for regenerative agriculture. And, and I think we, the thing we have to watch is that we don't start putting a whole lot of um, parameters around this, but we really do keep it principle based and we allow our farmers to use their ingenuity and to find what works in those local contexts. So um, I think the most important thing we can all do is to learn and understand nature, um, to get that, you know, the new frontier really is the microbiome, whether that be the soil or your gut, and to know that we really don't know very much yet. And, and I think the more we can partner our farmers and assist them to be the people to lead this change. Um, we have an enormous opportunity in this country to really be a clean green country and to have a premium um, food production system that is one that is based in, in the health of our environment the, and the health of our people. You know, nutrient dense food is you know, the next medicine. So, you know, let, let us lead that way, lead the way in that. And I think that therein lies our opportunity. And you can do that equally in your home garden. Kia ora, Jules, beautiful points. And the image around um, coexisting with our environment and how we build that relationship with our environment and learn and expand our knowledge, I think is another thing that we should definitely come back to um, as we move through this discussion. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think the next person we've got down might be James. Yeah. Kia ora, James. <laughs> Kia ora, Sophie and everybody. Kia ora, Koto. Um, thanks very much, first of all, to Sophie for the opportunity to be involved in this tonight. It's a, a great group of people you've got together. Really interesting. Kia ora. Uh, so I'm James Renwick. I'm an atmospheric scientist, a climate scientist. I'm at Victoria University. Um, as Rod Carr was saying just before, I'm also on the Climate Change Commission working with him, which is really fascinating work. And I'm also an author with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so we're working away on the, the next assessment report at the moment. So things that are top of mind for me right now, I would say the first thing is that, you know, now really is the time for action. Um, we will have locked in one and a half degrees of warming in another 10 years, uh, unless we take some pretty drastic action every year from now on. You know, there is really no time to waste. Um, and I think the other thing that I think about a lot right now is that we've all seen an example lately of how if everybody works together, everybody does the same thing, and we have leadership from government, that we can really make a difference as a community, as a, as a global community. You know, the, the levels of air pollution have dropped amazingly over the last couple of months. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions have gone down. You know, we've paid a terrible price for this. Hundreds of thousands of people have died and we don't want to have to have a pandemic to, to do this, but at least it gives us an example that collective action by individuals really can 
make a difference. And I hope that we can capitalize on that, use that as an inspiration to take the sort of ongoing action we need to reduce emissions and, you know, halt climate change, essentially. And we have to get on with that as soon as possible. And I think one of the messages I take from this, and one of the things I know is that we all have to work together. There's got to be a lot of cooperation to get to the goal uh, we need. The, the idea of a just transition um, involves everybody. And it's, it's not about um, sort of looking after your own. It's about helping others as much as possible. So people in Kapiti helping other parts of the country, other regions, New Zealand helping other countries around the world to achieve their goals. So I think New Zealand, I think Kapiti could be a leader in New Zealand for um, movement towards a zero carbon economy and uh, the sorts of things Jules mentioned, a regenerative agriculture. And um, I really like Mahina Arangi's comments about sort of decolonial, decolonizing the thinking around the environment and just living within our ecological means. So I think, I really do think the Kapiti Coast can lead the country, can show the country how it's done, both in terms of adaptation work around managed retreat from the coast, um, coastal restoration, coastal defences, um, agricultural practices, working with government to get fully renewable, renewably powered public transport, um, developing distributed generation of renewable energy, solar panels and wind turbines in the region. There's, an, there's a lot of things that the community here on the coast could be doing and I think we could uh, export the ideas around how we do these things to other parts of New Zealand and really help other regions um, get to the same goals that we all need to get to of a, a zero carbon dioxide uh, economy and lifestyle. So uh, I, I really just wanted to say that, you know, now is really the time for action. And I think it's great to see so many motivated and committed people uh, involved in the uh, an event like this and if we can just share our ideas and, and really get going on um, reducing emissions wherever we can then that's that's what we should all be aiming for so that's really it from me for now I'll hand back to you Sophie. Thank you James I think maybe at the end we might pass it all around pass it around um, to each person and kind of go over our vision I think some of those things that you mentioned James I think it's really important to um, when we're wrapping up this corridor and when we're talking about climate change too, to really um, share that vision um, because all of the science can be pretty um, doom and gloom and can be quite um, overwhelming and um, make us all feel a little bit powerless at times. I know I'm, I'm feeling like that relatively often, but, um, but we do have like the power. Can, it's a, it's yeah, over it's to people, us. People like you that will give, that give me hope and um, yeah, that people power and uniting behind a common goal. So at the end, let's all share our vision. So have a think about that while we're, um, continuing the corridor. Mary, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, so tanaka lava. Um, I'm Mary, my honor Cordeo, and yeah, I'm really happy to be here, really excited to be um, using my long weekend to talk about climate action. Um, I'm from the villages of Whanafa, Malia, and Laova'a in Samoa, so I'm a proud daughter of Samoa and the Pacific and New Zealand, and I'm representing the Pacific Climate Warriors um, the Pacific Climate Warriors is a global movement, so we are a collective of climate activists, educators, artists, and leaders from 15 islands, um, and we actually have about six teams across the diaspora, and so we collectively work to highlight the vulnerabilities of our islands, but also in the same breath highlight the leadership and the resilience and the strength that Pacific countries and Pacific communities have, have had in um, adapting and responding locally and, and internationally. So I wanted to share that to kind of, to indicate that I stand here on like quite literally the shoulders of giants who have really um, pushed this movement and climate action, I think, to where it is today. In saying that, um, my reflections has been a lot on like COVID-19 and how that's really highlighted like who are our most vulnerable communities. And I think of that in the context of climate change and, and in a way it's both heartening, but also it's a mixed feeling of communities were able to really mobilize and respond to COVID-19 and see those who are the most 
vulnerable in terms of being affected by COVID. And the Pacific has been calling for that for decades. The Pacific for years have been saying, we are the first to be impacted by this, cri by this crisis. We are currently being impacted by the impacts of inaction. Um, but despite that, we're also leading in our response. So I think for me, it's really important to center that. And I also think it's important to recognize that New Zealand is in the Pacific and has a historic relationship with the Pacific, colorful, both good and bad. But New Zealand has also been, sorry, New Zealand has also been, um, has also benefited from the relationship with the Pacific. And Pacific communities for years have contributed to what New Zealand is today. And so our bold and our bold action in regards to climate change needs to also be informed by how we move in the Pacific and as a Pacific country. Um, some key things I've been thinking about, you know, we all have a role to play in this, in this movement. COVID was a perfect example of people's ability to come together and build community, build resilience and respond. Um, I've also been reflecting on the fact that people have really united behind the science of COVID-19 and people need to do that for climate change. It's been clear for years. We have multiple scientists on this call um, and yet we're still discussing, you know, whether it exists or not, we are so beyond that. Um, and so I think it's also important in, in talking about that, that we move beyond, that we accept that the science is there and we begin to move beyond that and understand that it's also for a lot of us a moral and ethical issue. And the way that we communicate that and engage in that needs to be reflected um, in our decision-making processes, in our organizing and in our communities. Um, in relation to our decision-making, I think you invest in what you care about, you invest in who you care about. And often we talk about valuing indigenous, indigenous knowledge. Um, but I think people don't really know what that looks like. And I think that's because people don't value, truly value that knowledge and therefore they don't seek it. And I think there needs to be a genuine effort to acknowledge that what we've been doing has been missing that lens, has been missing the gift of indigenous knowledge in terms of solutions um, and response to climate action. Um, and also recognizing that that knowledge speaks to those who have been disproportionately impacted by climate change. So I have, I have a lot of thoughts. I think climate change transcends politics and science. And it's a fundamental question about how we as a people are going to work towards saving our common home. Um, and as a Pacific person, as a someone who has an indigenous perspective, I think it's also important that indigenous people and indigenous communities are bold and say, hey, actually we are the benchmark of environmental stewardship and we have been for centuries. Um, and we need to reflect on our decision-making processes, our structures and our systems, if we, are to if we are to have a just transition and a just recovery post COVID and in regards to climate change. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm excited for this conversation and this call it all. Oh, kia ora Mary. I was like clicking my fingers the whole time. That was awesome. And yeah, some, some um, common themes in there and some things that we definitely need to discuss more um, as we move through the call it all. Some awesome thoughts coming out and um, yeah, really, really grateful to have all of your perspectives as part of this discussion. And um, it needs all of these different perspectives and uh, yeah, uniting behind that common vision and having these kinds of discussions that totally I agree Mary like transcend politics and um, yeah it's just thank you that was beautiful. Um, Lindsay would you like to introduce yourself next? I'm Lindsay Craig I'm Council Manager at Kapiti Coast District Council Sending kindness from my bubble to yours. Um, Sophie kindly invited me into the conversation. Um, so I'm currently leading the community-led coastal adaptation project for our Kapiti community, which is a crucially important, significant piece of work. 
we've, as a, as a project team, we identified three key uh, elements to the project for it to be a success. That being transparent, accessible, evidence-based science, the indigenous knowledge of our Tangata Fenwa and our community. The real um, crucial importance um, in ensuring that the grassroots approach to this area is has been shown throughout the COVID response in the fact that no one person's actions alone could have combated this pandemic that we were facing. And that's exactly what we need to be looking at in terms of this climate change space. We need to collectively come together to work together to find solutions and those solutions will come from the indigenous knowledge, will come from the science, but will come from the empowerment of our communities. And I'm really, um, my sort of area that I'm really intrigued about is how do we ensure that we empower our communities? How do we inform and build that environmental literacy without putting people off the situation at the same time? We have people that are feeling quite alarmist around the uh, information that's out there in the media to people that are sort of burying their head in the sand or are dismissive of the, of the situation altogether. How do we take responsibility for ensuring that the right terminology and understanding is out there at a level where it resonates with people on an individual level so that we can come together as localized communities to come up with local solutions. And that is very much um, part of that is, is of course ensuring that um, we work collectively in partnership with our indigenous partners and also ensuring that any information and, and science that comes through is is communicated in a way that doesn't scare people and also enables people to understand what it means and the small steps they can take in their own communities to really make a difference because that's the only way we're going to get anywhere and I think that we we work very hard in terms of the the project that we're involved in at the moment in trying to ensure that we put the message out there to the community try and encourage people to come involved try and make sure that the language we're using is not too complicated and that's not to put anyone's knowledge base down that's because some of the terminology we use it instantly can be off-putting for people and also not to marginalize people any further because they don't have a grasp of an understanding or because they themselves will be more deeply affected by these issues as we go forward i think that's going to be the the, the, the key to this and also having those really difficult conversations how do we ensure that when there's two different opinions on either side of the table around climate change and around what we should do to find solutions how do we cut through that so that everyone is as much as possible on the same page so we can work collectively and that means having difficult conversations up front and for me another key element is that we talk about climate justice but we also need to be talking about this as a human rights issue we look at the paris agreement sustainable development goals this is very much hand in hand with human rights and our duties from a social economic um, perspective we as a community and individuals within that community have rights to each other but also to our mokapuna to our um, tamariki as we go forward and i'm very keen to be able to let our future generations to be able to look back and see that we made a difference with what we were trying to achieve and it's going to be a long road ahead of us and i think that's another thing that COVID has taught us is these we cannot make um, a difference overnight and i think people get frustrated about the slowness of progress and people dismiss the importance of corridor but that's the only way that we're going to build resilience we know that communities that plan for change are more resilient when there is a response is required so I'm really um, excited about these opportunities to put the information out there for people to sit in their own homes and listen to this information from all these um, expertise around this virtual room. Um, and but how we build on that going forward to ensure that we keep building those blocks of environmental literacy and enable people to feel empowered to make a difference within their own homes, within their own communities. So. Thank you, Sophie, for this opportunity, and um, I look forward to the rest of the corridor. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm hearing quite a few um, common themes coming out around communication. How do we communicate to empower? How do we communicate that this is beyond politics? How do we communicate the importance of working together? How do we communicate the importance of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous voices? So 
um, yeah, noted that down and we'll, we'll definitely continue the discussion. Um, one more person to introduce themselves, Rod Oram. Well, uh, kia ora tato. good evening and a, a real pleasure to be with you all. Thank you, Sophie, for inviting me. Uh, uh, Auckland, Tamaki Makoro is my home, but my wife and I are down here in the Waikato for the weekend at Manga Tautri, uh, one of the great um, inland island sanctuaries, 47 kilometres of predator-proof fence and predator-free since 2006. So it's a real treat to be down here. Uh, I'm a business journalist and um, my central preoccupation is how... Um, 10 billion people by 2050, up from about 7.8 billion now, uh, will be able to live uh, well uh, on this planet and with this planet. And of course, that requires a, an extraordinary transformation in our values and in everything we do. Um, the climate crisis is central to that because uh, the escalating crisis is doing so much damage to ecosystems and thus to our life support systems. Um, so I can never think about climate uh, just on its own, but always in that much um, broader context. And although that's uh, a totally global issue um, and on all of these uh, interlocking issues uh, across the world, uh, uh, it's terribly important that the action is on the ground locally, uh, whether it be here at Mangatautri, as it has been over these years, or back in Auckland, uh, or with you on the Kapiti Coast, uh, because there is a great deal that we can all do locally, and I'll come back to some examples of that in a moment. Uh, but my very great concern is that um, the COVID crisis has um, shown us what happens when we take our foot off the neck of nature, if you like, uh, when economic activity plunged. Uh, it's fallen uh, far more in the first few weeks of lockdown than it did in the first three years of the Great Depression. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more economic dislocation yet. Um, and of course, it's right that uh, governments are spending a great deal of money to um, support individuals, support companies, support sectors through this. But it's also incredibly important to get across the message that it's in, uh, absolutely possible, absolutely desirable to be able to uh, create jobs uh, and support people and help companies um, transition economically during these very difficult times by also embarking at the same time on our transition to um, a low carbon economy um, and that the two go hand in hand. And um, that's what's been bothering me a great deal uh, because around the world so far, uh, uh, only at the best count about 10% of stimulus funds has been uh, going down that road. Although there are some very um, encouraging signs such as uh, the European Union is now talking about a 750 billion euro fund um, uh, to play to exactly that. But in our budget, uh, yes, there was uh, $1.1 .1 billion uh, for the environment, which is going to create 11,000 jobs. But that was for pulling up weeds. It was for um, knocking over wilding pines. It was for de dealing to more predators. So all it was doing was manicuring the mess we're making. It was doing nothing to actually deal with the systemic issues. And um, I know there's a great debate going on in government at the moment. There's some 2,000 infrastructure pro projects vying for government funds um, in the next announcements, series of announcements on um, uh, COVID recovery related infrastructure projects. And one of my favorite examples uh, is uh, uh, Town. it's um, Hamilton. Uh, and it's got a, a fabulous plan for what they call the 20-minute city, that everything you uh, need and want in that city is, would be within 20 minutes of walking or cycling or public transport. It's a very well thought through uh, plan, uh, which would fundamentally change um, the urban landscape, the built environment of um, Hamilton over time, and make it a far more um, livable city, uh, and economically stronger, because it would be uh, more desirable too. But it's up against completely extraordinary projects, such as one from the Waikato Regional Council, which is the Muggeridge pumping station out on the Hauraki Plain. $18 million to make sure that um, 1,100 hectares of dairy land there, uh, which is already suffering from rising sea levels, uh, gets pumped out, and so they can keep dairy farming there. And there's this... Um, 
deeply um, cynical um, gesture towards transformational change, that the plan includes two hectares of blueberry growing and 120 beehives, um, as which uh, versus the 1100 hectares of continuing to dairy farm essentially below sea level. Um, and so there, I know that there's a uh, great debate going on um, in government about how spending is going to be happening um, over um, a series of um, uh, rollouts of infrastructure spending uh, on a pretty much an eight week cycle. And one, if uh, the current coalition wins and stays in government, that would carry on next year. But unfortunately, we're getting uh, the sort of response um, as Shane Jones came up with um, this past week as Minister of Infrastructure, um, that he said that uh, he didn't believe there was a public appetite for any kind of um, green recovery. Uh, and he was deeply disparaging about the whole idea that somehow it didn't create jobs. So in the budget, there was enough money to... Um, better insulate 9,000 houses, but we've got more than half a million houses in New Zealand with um, inadequate um, um, uh, insulation. And yet we know the return on investment um, from uh, and the improvement in health in raising the standards of those houses, uh, and of course creates fabulous jobs as well, um, is an example of what can be done. So here's a quote from Jones. The notion that somehow we're going to issue a green edict and all of a sudden we'll be driving hydrogen cars and legally smoking dope in the new economic nirvana is just never, ever going to work. And um, so that got me thinking about um, not just economic change, but political change is very much on my mind too. It seems to me that uh, as a first step, um, in some new politics around this, um, it's to form a new coalition. Uh, it's a coalition of people who no longer identify by their traditional um, party labels, but identify really strongly with the sort of issues uh, that we've been talking about here this evening. And I know um, that that does actually um, transcend enough traditional party boundaries that you could bring people, uh, enough people together uh, to form an effective government on that. Um, and that clearly would be a government without New Zealand first. And um, uh, so two points about that. Uh, the first one is uh, we, at this next election in 15 weeks' time, uh, need an absolute youth quake. Um, youth voters are still seriously underrepresented in, uh, um, in elections. We've seen wonderfully what happens locally, like um, Sophie um, being elected at Kapiti or Sarah Thompson um, in um, Hamilton City Council uh, or Tanitha in um, uh, Wellington City Council. Uh, so we know we can do this. So I, I would just, uh, I'm too young to be part of a youth, uh, I'm too old to be part of a youth <laughs> quake. But I would just urge you all uh, to, and I could lend you whatever help you want to get that going. The other thing is to come back to that um, essential nature and um, that there is still lots of we can do, a huge amount we can do locally in terms of um, building support, building understanding for the sort of um, regenerative agriculture issues, for example, that Jules was talking about. And, and therefore, um, having those conversations in communities is fundamentally important. And therefore, being able to um, uh, uh, do local projects and uh, in Kapiti, you've got this uh, glorious territory that goes from sea to beach and low-lying land, some of it threatened by rising sea levels, up into the bush behind. Uh, there's some good agriculture there, and there's some um, um, good bits of um, built environment uh, that um, can be expanded and improved on. Um, so I, I think you've got a terrific canvas in Kapiti uh, to be able to uh, play uh, a very strong role leading by example. Kia ora, Rod. Okay, so we've got an hour left team um, and we've got a lot to talk about <laughs> and a lot to discuss. So we're going to get straight to these questions um, that have come in from people, but also that I've been just adding to a little bit um, as you've all been speaking and sharing your thoughts so far. So um, Mahina Rangi, I'd like to pass over to you to um, maybe kind of start off a discussion um, around the lessons from COVID-19 and from the response and how that might be um, applied to um, addressing the climate crisis, but also you did touch on that um, briefly when you spoke and also then um, linking back in with 
what Rod was just saying around um, the structures of decision making and linking in with the structural issue and um, that's come up quite a bit and how, how do we show that there's public appetite for this and how do we use the structure that we have uh, or change this or how do we change the structure to be able to show that there is public appetite for this and that there are people coming together and having these discussions and there's energy and there are ideas there's visions out there um, so I guess yeah beginning with that what are the learnings um, and then how do we use that to really influence and change our system and and be a part of that structural change and I guess hopefully you all have thoughts on that so we'll just throw it out there um, but Mahina Rangu if you'd like to kind of premise that discussion and then um, anyone else can follow on after her. Sure thing. Um, yeah, so what we've learned from COVID, um, there's no doubt that it's been incredibly effective um, how the governments approach this and, the, and the, the place that we're at now in terms of human health. Um, and I agree it's, you know, there's inspiring things about how the community can come together. Um, but actually there's a few things that alarm me greatly about um, the experience of the response to COVID. Um, Rod has mentioned the RMA accelerated consent process um, and, and probably more specifically for Indigenous communities. Um, it, what, what I've really seen is the way that um, Indigenous peoples are often framed as obstacles to getting the outcome that the state needs. So in the case of the um, hapu getting together on the East Coast or in the North or in Taranaki, um, actually doing their best to improve their survival and to protect their community, they actually encountered huge opposition um, and racist rhetoric in response to actually taking action as a community. So um, I, I, that sort of made me think about, it kind of depends who the community is um, in terms of what's considered acceptable community action and the barriers to indigenous communities and in actually taking action. Um, and I, I'm, I'm personally quite concerned about um, the proposed um, accelerated RMA consent process. Again, this to me just reflects um, a, an intent to kind of reduce the ability for the community to be involved in decision making. And there's this fundamental assumption that um, somehow a faster decision making process leads to better economic and better overall outcomes and I think that's totally unfounded um, if I think about you know my day-to-day -day work is dealing with RMA consenting and the projects that I consider having the greatest overall benefit are ones that don't see the involvement of community and mana whenua as being an obstacle but engage them right at the beginning and plan really well so I'm very concerned about um, doubling down on what's already quite a flawed decision-making process and, and doesn't have good outcomes for the environment. Um, Rod Oram has just referred to the example in Hauraki. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested if, if it's possible, if there's other members of the group that ha have anything more to say on that point. Um, from a mana whenua perspective, from a Māori perspective, I think we actually need to mobilise. Um, my understanding is that the government is actually, they're, they're probably going to try and get that into law very quickly. Um, and so from a climate change perspective, I think I, I'm just really worried about the types of projects that are likely to be accelerated um, under the regime. And I'm not really hearing any guarantees that there is going to be this climate lens that ensures the right projects will be accelerated or planned in the right way. Yeah, go for it, Jim. Right. Um, well, Mary brought it up as well, but this is probably something for James and Rod to pursue. I think the good lesson was COVID in this country. It was led by science. And we've had so much, I'll call it science fantasy, and because everybody can get onto the internet, they're instant scientists. Well, the brilliant thing is the countries that did the best were led by the science, where the, the politicians deferred to the scientists, and you saw brilliantly what happened to you. Um, so within this, I was very disappointed. I rang up Sean Hendy, 
And I said, I bet you weren't funded for this. And he said, no, he wasn't. So all his modeling he did out of the goodness of his heart. And New Zealand, I'm not thinking of my or anything, but we only spend half a percent of our GDP on science, um, which is abysmal. We should be up at 2% or more. And um, we need to invest in science. So I don't know James can answer this, but he's seen many people coming through his doors wanting to go on in science. And really, um, it's a technical issue that needs to be well understood. And my plea is that we need to put resources where we need the information and let's get out of the science fiction space. And I think we saw the best examples there. I'll leave it there. And it's called, uh, we went through a period in the 2000s where there's pushback on climate change and Naomi Oreskes wrote a brilliant book called The Merchants of Doubt where the corporate world and I think James and I were on this journey. You get all the climate. I called them denialists because being Jewish, I can talk about denialism. And it's the same as Holocaust denial. I'll leave it there. So Mary, if, if you don't mind, we'll go to you next. Um, you did mention um, that this is beyond politics. How do you think that um, we can all communicate that fact that this is beyond politics? Um, and how do you think that people can kind of play their role in that dialogue? And how can we communicate about climate change in a way that empowers communities? And I think, well, if we open that up to you, Mary, and then pass it over to Lindsay to kind of expand on that point as well, because it's extremely important. Yeah, that's a big question. It's a good question. Just rolling back to what Jim was saying, <clears throat> I think the science is important, it's critical, and we all do need to unite behind the science. But I also think we need to understand that science alone isn't the best way to reach people and that we need to communicate exactly. our vision through an accessible language. Um, and also kind of rec you know, acknowledging what Mahina Rangia said, um, in the New Zealand context, it has to start with like consultation, genuine consultation with indigenous communities. And when we look at the decision-making process or the consultative process, it's usually at the end um, or when the recommendations have already been determined. So I, I just wanted to circle back to that and, I, and acknowledge that for me, that's, that's where we would start. Um, in terms of communicating the issue, I feel like we've been, we're past, we're past that point in terms of in terms of debating like the solutions for, sorry, not to debate, debating the solutions, debating the problem. And I think we need to begin engaging in genuine consultation with those communities who are at the front lines, with communities who are disproportionately impacted by decision, the decision-making process. Um, so I think that's really important. I think it's one, it's one thing to say, you know, make the conversation relatable, but then it's another thing to not have people of those communities at that, at the table um, draft, like putting together those solutions and communicating that. Um, I also think it's a values thing as well. So we need to value the stories and the experiences of our people before we go in and start having those conversations with them. And I think often when we talk about how do we make um, this conversation more accessible, it can often become very extractive. It's as opposed to, it's more, how do we talk to you when it should be, you know, how do we talk, how do we have a conversation together and move towards a solution? Yeah. I think that leads in um, really well over to Lindsay to have a bit more of a quote or around how we empower our communities, how we do, um, as Mary said, stress the importance of that um, collaboration, that co-design from the beginning and how do we empower our communities through that process and um, make it really clear that that is what will give us the best outcomes. Kia ora, thank you. Um, 
I just wanted to pick up on the point around the investment in science. Uh, yes, extremely important. I think we also need to acknowledge the investment needed in our indigenous knowledge as well. Um, I'm a strong believer that we need the science, the indigenous knowledge and the empowerment of our communities to make a difference. And I think that is a, a they all go hand in hand quite heavily. What's really important in terms of how we communicate is We've got to communicate. I don't think the conversation around what the um, the issues are <clears throat> is necessarily um, hit home for everybody or is necessarily resonated with everybody. There's a lot of uncertainty. And one of the things that we've learned from a situation of huge uncertainty, which we're still in now, we don't know how long this is going to last or what the, the, the outcomes are going to be at the end of the day when we move through the levels. It's the same with the situation we've got at the moment. It's very hard for people to engage with something when they feel there's a level of uncertainty around it. They want to see something tangible or for, a, for an event to happen to um, for people to, to work together. I mean, that's what happened um, in, in the macro example. But I think we've got to be really, really conscious of, and I've said this before around the terminology that we're using, that we ensure we're using a common terminology that um, difficult um, concepts for people to grasp are, um, are broken down so that people can understand them in bite-sized chunks, that they're visually appealing, but also that people need to understand how that resonates with them in terms of their own situation. I think the other thing as well is, is we talk about um, oral histories and oral histories of our indigenous people, but also our oral histories is something that is very strong with every single one of us. And one of the ways that I think about when I'm looking at the coastline and how the coastline has changed quite rapidly over, um, over just my time living on the coast for the last 10 years, is we can look back and listen to these stories. We can, we can notice the change. We can see for ourselves with our own eyes the way that things are moving. The science is important, the indigenous knowledge is important, but letting the community themselves reflect on what is happening on their own doorsteps and then finding ways to develop shared solutions together that brings together the whole community, not just people who are living right directly on the seafront, it affects the whole of our district. And that's what we're trying to achieve with the project we're doing is, is we're trying to be proactive around the information we're putting out there. We've we held a, a community event to bring people into the conversation. We want to, we're encouraging more webinars on our website, similar to this, which breaks down the information, encourages people to become involved. But is resources available. It's kind of a one source of um, hope for people to go to in Carpentry around the coastal adaptation work and other ways they can find more information. And I think it's got to be, we've just got to be mindful that everyone is at different stages in the knowledge base of what is really happening, whether it be on a global scale or on a localized scale. So I don't think we can ever take our, our, our foot off the pedal in terms of constantly ensuring that that information is out there and updated. Make it relevant for people, make it easy to understand. Don't let people feel guilty because they can't do the full cohort of everything that is asked of them. And how do we work together as a community? Climate change solutions are a really key part of community cohesion as well, because it's something that resonates with every single one of us. It impacts our physical and mental health, economic, social well-being, our cultural values. All of those things are about bundled up into the, the triggers and the impacts of climate change. So it's how we uh, meaningfully engage with people and people feel empowered to then go on the journey themselves as well. So it's a, it's a constant um, empowerment and building block going forward. Ty. Yeah, someone, Rod, do you have some, some thoughts on this too? And then we'll um, move on to the next question after, unless anyone else has anything else to add. But Rod, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, yes, please, thank you. Um, COVID has been, remains completely fascinating for all kinds of reasons, but not the least of which was um, something that was very complex in science terms. Uh, we were able to um, understand uh, because we cut right to the absolute heart of the issue. 
and, and the, the messages and the actions around that and what was required of us uh, was very straightforward and, and easily understood. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was wonderful data. Um, quite a few people got, got hooked on, you know, how many new cases were there today, you know, tuning in at one o'clock for the latest score. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, engagement was astonishingly powerful. The only time I've seen that uh, so far uh, are in an ecosystem issue, uh, but it's one that gives me huge hope, um, is with our predator-free movement. Um, I um, initially, for about the first year or 18 months after Paul Callaghan threw down the great challenge of being predator-free by 2050. Um, I was deeply sceptical about it. I thought it was um, uh, too difficult, it was impossible, um, it would require too much money, it would be a distraction from other things. But I began to change my view on that when I saw how communities were responding to that. And one of the things I find fascinating is the way that um, it brings really disparate people together in a community. The sort of people, uh, chalk and cheese, you know, that hate, in other circumstances, they might hate each other. They, they'd rather cross the street rather than have to even acknowledge each other's presence. But they do come together on this. And, and there's terrific innovation um, and there's sort of pride in that. Um, and of course, there's very detailed um, uh, data on how many predators have been uh, uh, trapped uh, and all the rest. But importantly, people can see how their native bush is coming back and they can hear the birds and they can see how the, um, the bush is responding. So I, I, I think um, if we can find ways to deal with uh, not just climate change, but all of our great interdependent issues of deep unsustainability in that sort of way, um, I think we can engage people um, uh, in a way that we haven't so far on climate. And of course, we do see it. There are some brilliant um, people out there who do cut through on the messages uh, and um, organize things like school strikes. Thank you, Sophie, for that. Um, but um, that to me is the things I'm discussing there, uh, I think are some of the key ways that we could get uh, uh, real buy-in and some real action, especially locally. I think this leads on quite nicely to a question we had through for Rod Carr um, around how, how do we propel into action and what are the most potent actions individuals and communities in Aotearoa New Zealand, um, what actions can they take to address climate change and what are the ones that will have the most impact? And yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and potentially James Renwick and then we'll move to a question directly around um, agriculture, regenerative agriculture um, as part of this question too. So Sophie, I've often asked that question, particularly by young people who observe that they're not business leaders, uh, they're not necessarily in positions of power or influence, uh, they're not necessarily movers and shakers in their local communities, and they say, what can I do? And, and I think all of us have got four tools that we can use quite effectively. The first one is to remember that every time we buy something, we are voting for the whole supply chain that delivers that thing to us. And that as a consequence of that awareness, the fastest way to change what is produced is by consumers choosing not that. So I wouldn't underestimate the power of consumer choice and preference when we do have discretionary choices about what we buy and how we express that preference in our consumer society. But the second tool that, that we all have is that we are often workers and can influence our employers or we're small business owners. And in those circumstances, there is the ability to change how we produce what is produced. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the power that employees can have to influence their employers and the way we go about running those parts of our economy. Um, thirdly, I would absolutely say that we have the power to influence others, our family, near, dear friends, uh, and reach further. And this is a conversation that all of us need to have with everyone. And there is a risk that in communities like this one, we're kind of talking to the converted. So I will continue to encourage my kids to talk to their friends and their friends who become better informed to talk to others. And finally, the fourth one I say is we are all 
eligible to vote. And if you don't like the politicians that get elected in our democracy, then you need to do something about it and be very clear with our politicians about what we expect of them. Because if we elect politicians who are not up for this challenge, are not bold enough to take and lead hard choices, then we will quite frankly get politicians who are weak and will not confront these hard choices. So four tools, we all have them, we should all deploy them. And James Renwick, did you have any thoughts on this question as well? Um, yeah, first of all, I'd endorse what Rod was saying. Um, absolutely right. And one of the points he made about conversation, about talking about the issue with your whanau, friends, workmates, whoever, I think that's a really important one. The more we can normalise discussion of climate change and get people thinking about solutions and action, the better. Um, something I often say to audiences when I'm speaking is anything that makes a difference makes a difference. If you can afford to and you have the discretion to reduce your carbon footprint by purchasing an electric vehicle or you can afford to travel on public transport more than use your car or you know whatever you can do, um, insulate your house better, all of those things would reduce the amount of fossil fuel you burn effectively. But I'm very aware that not everyone is in this situation. A lot of people just can't afford to make those kinds of choices. And, you know, I'm speaking from a really privileged, you know, comfortable middle class background. And I, I could afford to buy an electric car tomorrow. I haven't actually done it yet, but we're getting closer. Um, you know, I, I can make lots of, lots of choices and live in different ways. And I know there are a lot of people who just can't do that. And until governments set the scene for the society in a way that it makes it easy for everybody to be greener, then it is going to be hard for a lot of people. So I think part of that conversation thing is sticking it to your elected representatives, like Rod was saying, voting, absolutely. But, you know, send an email to your MP, make a bit of noise, go on a march. All of those things are really important too. And if you're really up for it, be like Sophie and Tamitha, you know, stand for uh, election in local or central government. It's, it's incredible. Um, just how far you can go, I think, and you just need to, to look at them. And, you know, I'm not saying everybody's going to do that or everybody's Greta Thunberg, but the individual has a lot of power. And, um, yeah, don't be afraid to use it. Thanks for that, James. Passing on now to Jules. How can farmers be supported to farm in a climate-friendly way? And also, if you wanted to touch on also the, the point around coexisting with our environment, how can we support farmers and people alike to um, discover that and discover the importance of, of that? I think, you know, what's fun to well, what I personally find, because I work with farmers all the time, is, and I think it's the same for all of us, we don't necessarily have a really good understanding of biological processes, you know, um, touching on what Jim said about. Um, science I mean science has a role to play and it has a really important role to play but it is only as good as the questions that are being asked and by the research that's been done and I think uh, I think one of the things we maybe are missing out on on, on on as an opportunity is really validating particularly in the farming community and in the, in the regenerative farming community a lot of the citizen science that is being done and, you know, what we need to be able to do is to, to measure and validate what works in our local context, you know, what works in a particular catchment, what works under, you know, certain circumstances or in certain environments. And I think, again, it's about, it's about having those open dialogues. And, and there's a very good group down south called Quorum Sense that got started in Christchurch. And what's come out of that as a, you know, as a community conversation that's now nationwide and beyond, is really mm -hmm. remarkable. That sharing of information and again the validation of what people are seeing and observing working in the field gives gives our farmers confidence to try new things. And and I think I think realizing that. Um, 
that farming is a really com it can be a really complex business and it's also quite risky. You know, when you when you talk to somebody and their the two hundred thousand dollars they were going to pay off their mortgage suddenly has become you know an extra three hundred thousand dollars in debt because of a drought. You you realize they're really in a in a stressful position. And I think it's a little bit like running from a tiger thinking that you're going to create a new possibility. It's not a really easy time to be inventive and, and looking newly for new ideas. So I think financially supporting our farmers as consumers getting really informed and using our, or, or, or having our voice be heard without the way we spend our dollars. And I think also realizing that your dollars do speak. So be careful that today's solution doesn't become tomorrow's problem. And, and I see a lot of that with, um, you know, say the vegan movement or something like that. It's, 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 it's not so much what you're eating that you need to be paying attention to. It's how is that food growing? Is that food growing in a way that it, it, is, it, it is creating an improvement and an upward centrific movement of, of, our, our um, environment, you know, are, are we increasing diversity? Is our water quality improving? Is the food quality improving? Uh, are all those measures, all those things that we can measure, are we building resilience? Are we now holding more water in our soils to build that resilience against droughts and floods? And, and I think it's very easy to rush to the next solution, you know, to build the next dam so farmers and orchardists have enough water to grow our food. But actually, what about our soil carbon sponge? How can we increase that, that ability to, for our, our soil to, to absorb and hold water so we do have what is called, what should be looked at as true resilience? So, yeah, I think there's, there's much we can do, but uh, I think at the basis of it is we all have a, perhaps an obligation to expand our understanding of biological systems. You know, science has taught us a lot about the chemical side of soil and farming and growing things. It hasn't, it hasn't as robustly taught us about the biological side. And, you know, life is a biological process and, and taking care of and working in harmony with nature requires we have a really good grasp of that. So, I think we all have that obligation um, to, to expand for ourselves. And like I say, yeah, support your farmers, don't blame them. You know, go out and find out what they're really dealing with. Go and talk to them, go and drive down the driveway and take a spade and go, go and dig a hole and find out what really makes life tick. It's what's below your feet. Oh, kia ora, Jules. That was... That was beautiful, beautifully put, thank you. This question, this next question has come through a few times actually. So I'll throw it out there for anyone um, to have a go at and then we'll um, start thinking about wrapping up, maybe going around once more, um, as I mentioned earlier, potentially um, talking about a little bit more about your vision for uh, where, where to next? What are the kinds of actions that we need to take in the near future? And what are, what are some of the actions that individuals can take um, leaving this, this webinar, watching this live stream, what can people do? Because um, I think hopefully this will have inspired people, um, motivated people and left them feeling hopeful um, and wanting to and be a part of empowering their community and be a part of an empowered community. So this question has come up a few times as mentioned. Um, what is the best way to get our government policy and decision makers to rapidly enact legislation and provide funding for effective climate action initiatives? So essentially, how, how can we best put pressure on our elected officials, on our elected leaders? Open to anyone. <laughs> That's one for Rod, isn't it? <laughs> Rod Carr? <laughs> well, both Rods can have a go. So look, I have a go first, but, but, I, but I do think it's being very clear with elected officials and those who would wish to represent us that this is a mainstream conversation, it's not an optional conversation, that it's a, a conversation that spans traditional political spectrums. It's not dominated or monopolized by any particular political party, that it is evidence and science-based, it is urgent, and that at the end of the day, 
our elected leaders need to stand on firm ground when they say we need to go through quickly processes to act now to reduce gross emissions of CO2 equivalent gases. Anything sooner is better and more sooner is best. And we need to prepare New Zealand to adapt to climate change because it is going to happen. And there is no doubt that well-planned and well-executed adaptation is going to be less chaotic, is going to lead to better outcomes than if we simply respond to every emergency, every flood, every fire, every tidal surge on the day or after the day it happens. Mm. So in some ways, it's making it absolutely clear to those who would hold themselves out to represent us that this is a non-negotiable part of their individual and personal commitment if they want to be leaders in Aotearoa New Zealand in the 21st century. Yeah, well put. I see James got his little thumbs up in the corner of his screen. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that question? Any well, I'll just say it very quickly. It's really all about climate risk resilience. And what we're doing is putting in an insurance policy for the future. I mean, we all insure our, well, hopefully most of us <laughs> insure things. You know what happens if you don't. And really, that's what it's about. I also think the other way of framing it is, is a least regrets policy. Yeah. Look, if it turns out that it's not happening quite as fast or quite as bad as some of us believe, then we're going to end up with a brighter, cleaner, greener, more equitable, resilient and sustainable society. This is not something to regret. If on the other hand, it turns out that things are deteriorating as fast or faster than we genuinely understand, then we've already left too much behind. So getting on with it now is the least regrets option available. Yeah, I, I agree, sorry. Am I, am I to that? Sorry. I was just going to say, um, Rod, you're muted. Rod Oram. He wants to talk. Do you want me to let, is Rod talking? No, no, no. Lindsay, after you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I was just going to pick up on the back of that. It's very much around, we cannot afford to wait for the change to happen before action is taken. And I think it's a little bit like buying health insurance. You don't buy it thinking that you, you would want to ever have to take it out. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the reality yeah. is, is that we need to start making these steps and we need to start making them now. And when we're talking about how can we make sure that our governments are going to listen and to, to really take up um, the challenge about making some change, it's that collective voice, it's that collective understanding. And this is where we keep going back, back to the grassroots approach. I know I keep banging on about it a little bit, but if we don't inform people at grassroots level, if we don't empower people at grassroots level, if we don't let people understand the science and the indigenous knowledge and the impact on themselves as a community, and then where they can take that conversation to, then we aren't going to see the change. It's the collective force from the grassroots that will help to make people stand up and listen. And then there's going to be, hopefully, the backflow of support from central in that we have centralised science, we have centralised information, we have centralised support for this is what we need to be doing and to strengthen our commitments to our treaty partners to be fully involved in that journey. So that from, from me is my two pence work. Uh, thanks. For me, the absolute core of this is um, I don't think we're going to ever do enough about all this until we care enough. And um, we won't care enough until we um, actually understand what our relationship is with nature uh, and trying to persuade people that we are so uh, deeply uh, damaging uh, and compromising our life support system, <laughs> the ecosystems and the whole living planet. Uh, that's the reality we face. And it is uh, extremely daunting as an individual to think that these are all um, great issues beyond our personal power. Uh, each of us can only do this infinitesimally small thing. But on the other hand, if an infinite number of us do our infinitesimally small thing, that becomes uh, 
uh, amazing power, amazing change. So uh, I think it, it's about, as individuals, it's about being uh, a very conscious consumer, uh, understanding the impact you have and the choices you can make. Uh, I think it's absolutely about being a very demanding voter, uh, about being incredibly explicit and clear um, to um, politicians and civil servants, um, to businesses and the like, um, exactly how you see things and, and what you want to see happen. And the third thing is, um, we've, although we're individuals, we've got to be... Um, inspiring partners working with others so we can give each other um, hope and confidence uh, in what we do um, you know we can lead by example and and the great thing about that is that for me leadership's not about a top-down thing it's just very much um, within the group of people you hang out with um, your community your family um, and uh, those are the sorts of approaches thematically um, that, um, at least speaking personally, um, give me, uh, you know, keep mm. me keep me going on this. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. And Mary, too, I see, has something she'd like to add to this. Yeah, so I just wanted to add, and I think it's really important, and I will forever be that person that says this. <laughs> I think it's important to listen to people on the front lines as well. Um, and listen to your Pacific communities who are here. We're not some distant group of people who are the islands in the Pacific. You have Pacific young people here who have been calling. You see that in the marches last year. We stood at the front lines of those of those strikes, and we're and we're telling you, we're fe our people are feeling the impacts. And so I think that's really important to say. I also think um, you know our people have embodied harmony with creation for generations. You know our people the way we live is inherently sustainable. And so there is knowledge there to be learned from. There's knowledge there to learn around communications and what people value. So I think that's really important to center as well. And um, also kind of saying that we need to move this beyond politics and science. And I 100%, what we, how we move needs to be informed by science, but no one was ever, in, no movement was ever inspired by a scientific paper, I'm sorry to say. You know, but that that's what that's the crux of what we're informed by. But it's what people value and what are our core values that need to bring us together to move us forward. So I think people won't understand and people won't care until we break that this big political scientific message into something in, into what's relatable. How does this impact you? How does this impact your neighbor? How does this impact the Tokelauan student that sits, that sits next to you at school? Those are the communications and the, that's the communication that we need as well. And I think it's a really important to not take a one size fit, fits all approach and when we're communicating this message um, and that we're conscious of that. So I, I feel very strongly about that. Kia ora Mary, that was very important to mention there as well. Thank you for yeah, Jules. Yeah, I think just to add to that, you know, what I keep hearing, the theme that runs through all of this is that we really need to have a major paradigm shift. You know, our mindset needs to move like rapidly and and vastly. And and again, coming back to the farming community, you know, I don't see farmers that are out there deliberately doing anything that they knowingly that, that is knowingly harmful. Our farmers are farming as they've been taught to from our universities and from our industry. And I think the minute they see or understand where the disconnect is, that shift gives them that opportunity to really connect in, at a deeper level with nature. And the minute you do that, you can no longer do those things you've been doing. And you're not, you know, once you understand the harm that's been done. So I think, you know, again, it's, it's, it's taking on, all of us taking on being lifelong learners and the opportunity that gives and provides us to really be leaders in this situation, each and every one of us. Just looking at the time, mindful that it's almost quarter to nine. So we might start thinking about 
um, beginning to wrap up this conversation, but I think it's probably important to kind of pass the mic back around. Um, and if you can give people one kind of take home message, I know we've feels like we've covered off a lot, um, but yeah, one take home message for people at home. Um, and yeah, what kind of what kind of vision do you have for climate justice? What does climate justice look like for you? In a couple of sentences, if you can. So one take home, and then what does climate justice look like for you? Um, and then we'll close us off with the Karakia game. So if we begin maybe with Rod Orem, and then you can just popcorn it off to someone else. So you just send the mic on to someone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to go back to that point I started my, my last uh, comment with. Uh, it's, it's about our relationship with nature. Uh, that is uh, such an extraordinarily fascinating and inspiring thing. And that uh, as that develops, uh, I, I think we start to put a whole bunch of things right. Um, and so it, it's not about, you know, having some nice plants growing in your garden um, or um, having a, a bit of a tramp once in a while out in the bush. It's about um, really coming to understand uh, at, at some level of depth and, uh, and meaning about that relationship. Uh, and um, that's what I think will turn things around. And I think one of the most wonderful things that's happening in the country is uh, the way there's so much more discussion uh, of Mātauranga Māori, Te Ao Māori. Uh, I see it in, for example, national science challenges, particularly our land and water. Um, and um, so I think that that's one of the really important avenues um, for us to um, uh, work on our relationship with nature. Well, why don't I uh, hand on to, uh, gosh, I don't know when, um, um, Lindsay. Thank you, Rod. I think for me, um, I think what this comes down to is if we're trying to reflect on um, post-COVID um, and what lessons we could have learned from that is it's, it's almost been a sort of a PR comms exercise in terms of the, the, the messaging and the terminology that was used was consistent. The direction the leadership came from central government with a central reliable source of data and steps that people could understand in terms of what they could do in their own communities to take action. And I guess that's a sort of approach that we could hope for going forward. One source of truth, what one supportive um, sets of data and, and, and easily understandable information and to make it interesting and to make it relevant to people is, is really key. And I think we heard all this messaging around be kind to each other during the COVID. Well, be kind to each other and be kind to the environment is where we need to be taking this message forward. How can we be kind to each other? We can be kind to, to each other by also looking at our wider environment and us as a community and how we build that resilience. And that's how people become empowered. That's how people build their knowledge base. And that's how collective action hopefully will, will take us forward. And um, we're really keen to hopefully with the, the community, like the coastal adaptation work that we're trying to take forward, there's gonna be lessons learned as we, as we go forward in that. But we are trying to start as grassroots as possible in terms of having those conversations, having that information, having those difficult conversations and looking at shared solutions. But without the, um, the strong support from a central one, um, set of data and information and guidance and leadership. I think that's what is needed to, to really push things forward. Thank you. James, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I think my, my one message that from what I've heard tonight and what I was thinking before about the pandemic is, you know, every one of us can make a difference every day there's so many things we can be doing whether that's some sort of political action or being a conscious consumer all of these things i think we can all contribute to the solutions and i i just hope we all take that on board and in terms of so, of climate justice i guess what i would love to see is that you know whatever initiatives government take business investment and so on anything that helps us reduce our pressure on the environment, but also helps to reduce inequalities, you know, both within New Zealand and internationally, you know, it helps to reduce um, economic inequality, you know, ingrained 
racism, colonialism, all of those things, if we can shift the dial on all these things, it's going to be better for everybody. So that's what I would love to see. And I'm going to pass to Mahina Rangi. So James, um, <clears throat> so I actually believe that by and large, New Zealanders um, do hold those values. Um, I think New Zealanders do love nature. I think everyone actually wants to change and is trying to change. Um, I think the research that came out a couple of years ago is that 79% of New Zealanders think that climate change is important to them. And so I'm not saying there's not some value shifts that do need to happen, but um, is it perhaps that it's less about the values that need changing and it's more about um, the ability for those values to actually inform decisions? Because the decision making that's happening does not reflect what New Zealanders want to see. Um, and I, I don't believe that our current political structure, I don't believe our current constitution um, is actually capable of delivering decisions that reflect what we want because it's not designed to do that. It's designed to give benefit to a few. It's designed to accumulate wealth. Um, and so my wish or aspiration is to see this raising of consciousness, particularly with our Tangata Tiriti and Pākehā allies um, around constitutional transformation. And I would really encourage, especially our scientist mates who are very influential to look at Mātike Mai, um, which is some deep thinking around constitutional transformation. And then here in little old Kapiti, at the scale we're capable of doing it, we're looking at actually essentially in our own way changing constitutionally the way we're going to make decisions about, in this case, climate adaptation. And so um, I don't know if that's going to deliver, um, but I think there's many of us that are very invested in um, giving it a really good try. Um, and thank you all for your call to everyone tonight. I've found it really interesting. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mary. Yeah. Um, I think <clears throat> just touch on everything that's been shared already. I think this is a, for me, this is a difficult conversation. It's a complex conversation as well when it comes to politics and science, but it's one that has to happen. Um, I guess for me, I'm very much informed by the lens and the reality of Pacific communities in, in the islands. That's where my mom and dad are. That's where my brother lives. That's, that's how I move um, in this space now. And so I guess it's, it's really honoring and taking, you know, taking the frontline lessons, taking lessons from frontline communities around adaptation um, and ambitious climate action into, into New Zealand, I think. Um, I think both at a macro level and within government, I think, um, one thing that I feel is that in Pacific communities, the movements well, in, in the Samoan space. So last, the past week was Samoan Language Week. And so the movement for our independence happened because older generations and the younger generations came together for a collective move, which was for independence. And for me, I think that's what we need now. We need that inter, intergenerational collaboration across the country, across the region, to ensure that we're moving towards the same, the same goal. Um, and so I think it's all, all hands on deck. I think we understand that the crisis needs addressing. I do think we need to strengthen the language that we're in a crisis and the impacts are being felt now. I, I don't think that's um, as prominent as it should be in New Zealand. And um, yeah. I have a lot of thoughts, but I think I think we need to be yeah. coming together well, for a collective. We've got eight on. minutes, three speakers. Kia ora, Mary. Um, Jim. Yep, well, I'll be very quick. I've been on this journey for 45 years. 1980, postdoc at um, Climatic Research Unit. We knew what was happening and we Reckon bound 2000, everybody would know what was happening. 1988, we heard, heard the first 
Climate Change Conference in New Zealand. Sir Geoffrey Palmer opened it. 1990, we had the first assessments of what we needed to do, but we didn't do anything. 2000 came around and we didn't do anything. 2010 came around and we haven't done anything. The, we've got to act now and I very much endorse the partnership that some of us grey old men with um, Sophie's generation because they have the energy, they have the vitality. We've been fighting for years and I certainly welcome their involvement. Seems to have totally missed Generation X. There's the odd person like Lucy Talbot or Lucy Lawless who's climbed into it. But you've got your Ginty McTavishes, who was your age, Sophie, when she went on to the Dunedin City Council. You've got your Eleanor Lawton and up in Wanaka. We need you and you've got the energy and vitality. We do have some energy, so go for it. Cool, thanks, Jim. Pass on to Jules now. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you for creating this opportunity. Um, I think uh, if I look, I go, what stands out for me is, is human beings, you know, language is what we use and we create everything in language. And I think reframing some of how we speak about this is really important. You know, the, the terms we use like fight climate change just brings out all that adversity and, and, and creates a world where something is wrong. I think we need to reframe it and look at how do we harmonize with nature? How do we connect as one? Because we are nature. We are not separate. We live as if we, we are, but we aren't. So, you know, can we, can we start reframing the way we speak about this? Because our, the following actions will come from how we view it. So I think that's really important. And, you know, we've talked a little bit tonight about insurance. And, uh, and again, our daily actions will determine whether that insurance is ever needed or not. So if you have health insurance and you eat well and drink good water and do all those things, the chances are you'll never need it. And I think this is one of those cases we need to take those daily actions and however small they are, they're really vital. And, and yeah, we all need to be engaged and bring some joy to it. You know, it's not all bad. Like there's amazing things happening out there. There's like, you know, come and meet some of these farmers. They're incredible what they're, what they're accomplishing. So. Yeah, 100%. Sure. And we can, we can create the more beautiful world we all know is possible through these solutions. We can reduce inequalities. We can, yeah. And, and as was talked about before, if it turns out climate change is all a hoax, then we've created a more beautiful world for the next generation. So this is stuff that we should be doing anyway. So. Um, obviously it's not a hoax and we've got many people on this call that can prove that um, so but that but that is definitely something that is very important to talk about is that is that vision and is that positive world that can be created through our solutions to climate change um, Rod, Carr, I believe you're the last one last word <laughs> so I sometimes do the imagination of, of uh, being around in 2050 and having my grandchildren who will be 30 asked me the question so back then what did you do to make it a better world and I do think that's the challenge we should all have is do no harm fix it up make it better because we can make it a better world it's not just a question of it being less bad and I think engaging communities to make it better rather than just stop it being bad is part of that shaping a vision of a future world that people would aspire to be part of. And there is a danger at the moment that the, the scary science causes some in the community to basically turn away because it's seen as too challenging, too threatening, too depressing, another Chardonnay and denial is a much better way to live your life. So I think we've got to actually find that positive vision of a better future and then 
through our language and the instruments we all have, be able to look at our grandchildren and explain the positive part we played in delivering a better future for them. Wow, I feel like that is the perfect wrap up <laughs> to this corridor tonight. Um, once again, thank you all for joining and for um, contributing your thoughts. And um, this will be, uh, as I said, recorded. Um, and I'm planning on kind of sifting through some of these golden nuggets of, of different um, facado and thoughts that you've all shared and, and kind of finding a way to, as we said, communicate this and communicate this positive energy that we have here, um, the action that is happening, um, the mahi that you're all doing. So finding a way to, to really share this with the world and share this with Aotearoa. So um, thank you all once again for participating in this corridor on your long weekend. Um, and I'd like to close us off with the karakia as we've begun. Good everyone and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Sophie. Well done. Thank you, Sophie. Yep. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah. See you.